You've been, you've kind of been coming to Italy for years. Yeah, you? but it's it's very bad. I mean, I've, I've built this house and done everything. I can survive, but I have to work at it. So I've just had my little one book, Berlitz, <laughs> Teach Yourself Italian. Go and so on. But I could, I was, I was, you know, I could do past, present, and future. My prepositions get a bit confused occasionally, and my pronouns, I get all wobbly with pronouns. Strange. Yeah, I know. This. I do know. I do know. No. I'm not a natural linguist. Okay, apparently we start. Dewey comedy, eh? Dewey comedy. See the little, the little, they like little weird red eyes there, red-eyed rats, they hiding are. in the darkness. But they've got their own BDI on you. Mm. <laughs> okay, we okay. have got approximately one hour. What am I gonna? This is before the crowd. I'll be of talk. I'll have talked myself out. Well, I've warmed you up. We could probably just replay this for the crowd. <laughs> but they come to see you. You'll discover that the answers are the same, whether it's a camera or a crowd. Actually, uh, I mean, in fact, is, is, there a, is there a problem with interviews? Is the set response to generally the same sort of the same question? When you're, you're promoting a film, very quickly you know what the questions are going to be, and very quickly you start developing a set of answers that will, you know, perform. Uh, yeah, it's almost like writing a script at a certain point, you know, oh, there's, they're always going to come at you with these area, from these areas, and then you have responses, and hopefully they're entertaining and sometimes informative. Um, and after a while, it's like doing a performance on stage, because you know what you're supposed to do, you know how to deliver the lines. Uh, it gets particularly painful when you go to the States to do a junket, because we did on Brothers Grimm in one day, I did 72 interviews, and that's fairly repetitive. Do you ever find yourself changing your mind about something when you get asked the same question? Down the line, it clarifies an idea in your head, or do you think, I've been talking rubbish for the last six months? Uh, you realize at some point you're talking rubbish. At least you've convinced yourself that it's why you made the film, but you're probably wrong. And that's why it's good when you actually have an intelligent interviewer who catches you and makes you think, and then you, you've got to come back to reality again and start really talking about what you're doing or what you weren't doing. Uh, it becomes dangerously uh, predictable after a while. I begin to actually believe what I say. Uh, and sometimes with interviews, you actually do learn what you were intended to do in the film, and uh, forgotten somewhere along the line. Somebody jogs your memory or says, asks a question that throws you, and you're like, oh, Jesus, yeah, that's where I had started from, and I ended up over here somehow. So sometimes they're useful at making you understand what you actually, what crime you've committed against humanity. You've committed many crimes against I'm humanity. Afraid, yeah, so. You've been paying the price from time to time. Yeah? I do. There is, there is no you know, free ticket out of this thing. Once you've harmed a culture, that culture is out to get you. What got you into harming the culture in the first place? Is it animation or film direction or what? What started it all off? I mean, how I got into movies or how I no, got to do it. Like... Started. Full no. stop. I mean, way back, we're going way that far. Way back to when you way were back about in... six months old. As a, as a kid, I always cartooned. I always do cartoons from a very early age. And some of them were quite odd, some of them weren't. But the good thing about a cartoon is drawing is kind of magical to most people. If you write something, everybody thinks they can write. But drawing is... is fairly specialized and so I could draw well and people Ooh, that's nice and what was lovely about cartooning is you got an immediate feedback because it wasn't like fine art where people oh, you got a joke in there and you let people laughed and there's nothing more lovely than making people laugh so I was doing that from a very early age and I was as a kid I remember when I was about 11 my father built me a magic cabinet because I used to do magic shows Again, it was trying to you know, entertain or amaze people. So that was very early on. And really what happened, uh, the moment that something big changed in my life was when I was in my junior year of college and I was in the, in the summer working on, on the Chevrolet assembly line on the night shift in California. And I said, this is madness. This is awful. And I quit and said, I will never do that again, I'll never work for money again in my life, and I'll only do things that I have control over. And that was a really interesting moment because it closed most of the doors that were open at that time, le leaving the interesting ones open. So what were you doing before the Monty Python thing started? Um, well, after, in, in, in university, I edited the College Humor magazine. In fact, it was a, an arts and literary magazine when I started, and I turned it into 
a humor magazine. It was just, you get laughs. But, um, and, uh, and Harvey Kurtzman, who is, was the great mentor, the god of all of us cartoonists in, at that period in, in, in America, he's the guy that created Mad Comics. And he was doing a magazine called Help, and I was sending him my magazines, and he wrote a nice letter back. And so I graduated from college without any clear idea of what I was going to do. I said, I think I'll go to New York and meet Harvey. And he wrote a letter back saying, don't bother, there's no jobs here, you know, it's a waste of time and effort. And I went, and it just happened that the guy who was his assistant editor was quitting, and he was looking for somebody who was, would work below the minimum wage. And I was there, and I walked into the job, just literally like that. So for three years, he and I uh, edited this magazine called Help. And in the course of that, I met John Cleese. Uh, because we used to do fumetti. I mean, in Italy, people know what fumetti are, with like cartoon strips where people speak, but it's photographs as opposed to drawings. And we were looking for, we would pay $15 a day for an actor to be in these things. And John was in New York with the uh, Cambridge Footlights Review, uh, which included Graham Chapman. And they were doing sketches that had been written by Mike Palin and Terry Jones. This is before Python. I got John in one of these stories, got to know him. So years later, I'll just cut the chase. I, I worked in the meantime in advertising. I hitchhiked around Europe and eventually got to London. And I was still in magazine work and said, I want to get out. And John was appearing on television by that point. He introduced me to um, a TV producer who was an amateur cartoonist. He liked my cartoons. And he bought some of my written sketches and forced them upon Mike Palin, Terry Jones, and Eric Idle, who were doing a show called Do Not Adjust Your Set, which is a children's comedy show. And that was the beginning of the connection that became Python. So in a nutshell, how would you best describe the Monty Python series, the group, the style, mm. the humor, to somebody who's never heard of them or has never seen anything? There can be no one in the world who doesn't know of Monty Python. We are, we are everywhere in the world, in the far reaches of New Guinea. We, we, our shows play. It's quite extraordinary. It is all over the place, but how do you describe it? It's intelligent and silly at the same time. Uh, it's surreal, it's uh, anti-authoritarian, it's six guys who got away with murder, is really what it's about. Because we were really the product of education, because everybody had been well-educated at Oxford and Cambridge. and um, we We're also the beneficiaries of a very laissez af uh, why can't I say the word? <laughs> Laissez faire uh, attitude at the BBC. And the six of us went out to make each other laugh. And that's what we did. There was no interest in an audience or who would eventually reach. And somehow what we did um, just seems to translate around the world. And it, it should have died long ago. It's, it's now, you know, we began in 1969. That's a long time ago and it still plays. In America, it's probably playing somewhere every day of the, the week. It's a nice little earner, is it? Nice little earner, as you say, yeah, right out. It's, yes, our pension fund. Is, because we own the television shows. This is what's extraordinary, is because the BBC sold the last series to ABC Television in the States, and they trimmed them down, and we didn't like that, so we took them to court. And Mike Palin and I were in the high court in New York, you know, fighting for the right to be silly in our way. And uh, over the course of three years, they finally settled and the BBC gave us all of the tapes to our television shows and they go on. And then we started making movies and uh, we own a couple of those movies too. So all of this continues to feed my children and pay for the mortgage. At the end of the title sequence, this foot comes crashing down, right? Mm. Whose foot is that? Ah, now we come to Italy. Bronzino, a great Mannerist painter. And it's his painting of uh, Cupid and Venus. And the foot belongs to Cupid. You derive some kind of perverse pleasure that God's foot is actually... Well, it's quite interesting. <laughs> you could argue that, you know, it's love's foot and it always hurts. It crushes everything. Love crushes all. Do you ever get tired of being asked about Python? Not really, because it... If it wasn't for Python, we wouldn't be talking right now. I mean, it really opened everything that I wanted to do because I, 
I'd always wanted to be a film director, but I didn't see any way to work up through a system. I have no ability to do that. And so from you know, Python going into animation, which led to uh, Terry Jones and I directing the first Python movie, uh, Holy Grail, you know, this opened all the doors. And so now I'm a film director, thanks to Monty Python. So it was also a great time. I, I, I mean, I don't know how we did some of the things we did. We were just so, you know, exhilarated working. And there was a lot of tension in the group. And um, it, was, it was very exciting. But it was the best part was to have the freedom to do whatever we wanted to do. That's what was extraordinary. I wanted moving to, when you started doing The Holy Grail and Life of Brian, actually they were quite a fair few years apart. I mean, mm. Some people don't yeah. realize that there was quite a long break between the end of the series yeah. and the films. But uh, Holy Grail was before Jabberwocky? Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm not correct, correct, yeah. So when you, when you moved into film, from you, your point of view as an animator, did that give you more stuff to put your hands on, work in three dimensions and art direct more? It, the difficulty is moving from animation to film was, that as an animator, I basically worked on my own. And my social skills were limited. And it was when I started directing, uh, I realized I have got to start you know, involving other people more. Um, and it was difficult when we did Holy Grail because it was two directors, it was Terry Jones and myself. And we eventually agreed to split the work. He would talk to the others in the group because I got fed up with it, talking to them. And I would stay back with the camera and make sure it looked good. And that's, that worked nicely. When we did Jabberwocky, which is the first I did on my own, I was quite surprised that the actors um, thought, because my chair said director, that I knew what I was doing. So they would, would I, if I'd say, lie down in the dirt, I'm going to pour filth on you, fine, go right ahead. The, pr the, the, the tricky part was because with animation, you're thinking, you know, 24 frames a second. You're actually individual pictures. And it took me a while to break out of seeing just the individual pictures and start thinking uh, in a broader way. But once you got on a set and it was your, in case of Jabbok, it was just mm. you, did you find you were getting a taste for it? Oh, yeah. No, no, it was great. I mean, it, I loved it. I just, what, the thing with directing for me is that it's the business of cinema, if you're really serious about it, you know, involves you know, design, costume, makeup, acting, writing carpentry, painting, everything is involved in the thing, photography, uh, dance, movement. And I am interested in all of those aspects. So for me, it's great fun. And shooting a film is fairly a slow process. So I can, if, if it's taking too long to set up for the lights, I can go and, and play with a costume or something to keep active. So uh, it's, it's really like doing paintings, and, but paintings that move, but I really am interested in everything that's in, within that frame. You made a lot of short films. Mm. Well, how do you value, evaluate short films as a format, as a launch pad for bigger ideas? Mm, they're, they're different because I mean, it's like doing a commercial, 30 seconds. That's a quick idea. That's, a, that's like a joke. Or if you do a short film, it's maybe five minutes long. Um, it's, it's really contained. A feature is much more difficult to try to stretch something over a couple hours and keep the audience interested. Um, I, I think what I like about shorts, it's, it is like a bit like just doing a cartoon, like a drawing. It's an idea. You can flesh it out a bit, but you're not uh, involved in anything more than that. I, th I think I, I, in the instance of something like um, um, Meaning of Life, where the Crimson Permanent Assurance is the short, it was originally an animation idea I had, and I had storyboarded it. And I thought, oh, I, don't know. I don't want to do animation anymore. I'm bored with this. I'd like to do it for real. And uh, I convinced the others in the group to let me do it. So I basically had my own f separate film going on. Uh, and of course, I was getting carried away. And it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was b becoming more like a real film. Um, and that actually proved quite interesting because it didn't work within the body of the m main movie because Python sketches have a certain length to them and a certain rhythm. And suddenly it came along and suddenly we're into something that's like a real film, like an epic. And it was not working and the others in the group kept saying, cut it shorter, cut it shorter. And it, they were like studio executives. And, uh, and I, I reached a certain point and said, if I cut it any shorter, it, it's not gonna work at all. And I said, why don't we just take it out of the film and have it as the short feature before the main film and then it can come back and attack the main film later on. And so it worked out to be much better. And uh, 
I, I liked that kind of lateral thinking, which I probably enjoy more than anything, where you, you're stuck in a corner with this idea. So let's just turn the world that way and move that way and not continue down that path of thinking. And that's one that worked. And it's a uh, strange thing about that film, when we saw it in Cannes, on the big screen, the Crimson Permanent Assurance has got scale to it, real scale, it's big. And then you come to the film itself and it's like television in comparison. Once you're on a television screen, it doesn't work that way, but on a big screen, you really feel you've gone from an epic to a little film. Would you say it was that, the Crimson, I forget. Crimson Permanent Assurance. Crimson Permanent Assurance. Uh, it was the first time you established a style visually, live, rather than Jabberwocky or Holy Grail? I don't, I don't know. I think what, I never thought of it that way. I, mean, I just assumed I was just doing what I normally did, but it was kind of this semi-cartoon. Um, I don't know if the style is that different. I, I always, this is where it gets difficult because I always have a hard, uh, difficult time uh, understanding what my style is or actually what it is I even do. I have to rely on other people to tell me I just do what I do and other people think they have a better sense of it than I do and they're right. <laughs> I'm not aware of my style. I'm just, I do what I do. Uh, and I'm, and uh, people seem to talk about it knowledgeably as if it exists and I couldn't tell you what it is. How did you get Sean Connery for Time Bandit? Uh, that was, that was probably the biggest surprise of my life because when we wrote the script, when Michael Palin and I wrote the script, we put in a rather jokey uh, thing and it, and it said when the Greek warrior removes his helmet, he reveals himself to be none other than Sean Connery or an actor of equal but cheaper stature. And that was our little joke to ourselves. And Dennis O'Brien, who was the producer of the film and and was running Handmade Films, which was this company that George Harrison and Monty Python created. One day he was playing golf with Sean Connery and he mentioned the script and Sean read it and he liked it and bingo, we got the man. So it's not what you know, it's who you know who's playing golf with the guy you want. Exactly. There's so much of that in the film business. It's it's, the chance is such a huge part of what goes on, bumping into somebody at the right time. That was also a moment because I think Sean's career post Bond had been going down. Uh, and I think we were, hit him at his nadir. And, um, and it really changed his career after that because it started going back up like that. But he was, he was a joy because he was a very, he's a very tough character. He doesn't suffer fools. And, uh, we only had him for a limited amount of time and we ran out of time with him and I couldn't shoot the end battle the way it was supposed to be shot because he was supposed to die uh, in the big final battle with evil. We couldn't afford to bring him back and so he wasn't even in that scene and then I remembered something he had said to me when I first met him because he had suggested why couldn't the Agamemnon, the character he plays, come back at the end of the film as a fireman. And I said, no, no, no. we kill Agamemnon in t three scenes earlier. Uh, and then I remembered that. And he w was a tax exile in England, so he wasn't able to come into the country very often. He was living in Spain. But he, one day he did turn up and he was going to see his lawyer or his accountant, I can't remember. And I said, could he drop by the studio for just an hour or two? And he uh, drove, he was on his way to this place. He dropped by the studio. I put him in this fireman's outfit. We had one fire truck there. I did two shots, one with him coming into shot, putting the boy down, and then another shot getting into the fire truck and winking. And the fire truck drove out of the frame. That's all. And then a month later, I wrote the scene to put those shots into. And that's how the film ends now. Brazil. Um, where on earth did that come from? Port Talbot. Port Talbot is where Brazil was born. Port Talbot in Wales, a grim place, a place that steel mills are there. Uh, it's, it's a weird, there was a moment at this, in this, when I was there promoting, I don't know what I was doing in Port Talbot. I was sitting, and the sun was setting in this really grim place. 
and the, the beach was covered with coal dust, and it was awful. And I was thinking of a guy sitting there with a radio going around the dial, and it's like the end of the world, it's apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic, and suddenly he hears this Latin beat. <laughs> And suddenly there's somewhere in the world is magic and romance and beauty. And that was in my head. It was also a product of years of frustration, either working in offices, becoming more and more frustrated about uh, uh, terrorism with the Bader Meinhof gang and, and what was going on in Argentina and Brazil and the way governments were dealing with, quote, terrorists. Um, there was a lot of built up frustration in my life that all sort of burst out and that became Brazil. And who would have guessed that it all came true now in the 21st century in America? <laughs> Homeland security, everything that Bush is saying and doing comes directly from the script of Brazil. Which had nothing to do with 1984, did it? Well, there was 1984 in the air. It was approaching because, uh, in fact, we shot in 1984. And so it's floating in the air somewhere. I'd never read 1984, but I knew roughly what happened. So it was like dealing with all of those things. It's, you know, I, I think at times I'm like some big receptor and there's the big satellite disc on top of my head and it's getting all these channels and they're all just jumbled up and they're going in there and somehow they come out eventually. And, uh, and that's what Brazil was. It, was. it was really a kind of cathartic response to what I thought was going wrong with the world. Which has since got worse, though. Yeah, well, I got out of my system, though, but the world hasn't, obviously. So you're kind of zen about it. <laughs> Not my fault. I warned everybody. I said, <laughs> come on. What was it like working with De Niro? They say you should never work with your heroes, your idols, or the greats. Or children, or dogs. Uh, anyway, yeah. Bobby was a very interesting experience because I was so used to working with American... I mean, I was so used to working with English actors who are very fast, they come in, they know their stuff. Bobby falls, I think, into the, the, the realm of method acting. And he prepared and prepared. He was coming months in advance uh, with bits of costume. We built parts of the set so he could work on. He was so meticulous. And it was, it, it was, it was strange. It was almost as if his character was what the film was about because the amount of work that went into providing him all the things that he needed uh, to work with. Um, it was rather disproportionate to what was going on. And he came and he, he's, he's extraordinary, but the one thing I could never get my head around is the fact that Bob De Niro might be nervous ever. And uh, the first day shooting, he was just really nervous. I think it was because he'd been a big star for some years now and the idea of coming onto somebody else's film, because it's really Jonathan Price's film, uh, with a whole crew of people that have all been working for several weeks together, was, was really difficult for him. And, I, and uh, so we ended up doing a lot more takes than I was used to doing, just to get him to relax. But he's extraordinary. The thing that I think amazed me the most about him, because when I'm shooting, you know, there's the camera, I'm really here, and there's the actor right there. And I can't see what he's doing half the time. I'm looking at it and saying, mm, let's do better, another take, I'm not sure if we got it. And then the next day you see it on the screen, and it's like, Unbelievable. It's like he has this direct connection with the lens. And if you're one or two degrees off, you don't see what's happening. He's phenomenal that way. Given the context of your films, which is not, they're never flat, serious dramas or, or a standard anything. They're all over the place. And of course, you know you're going to have to edit it later. Mm. And so that's going to jumble up the rhythm mm. according to your desires in the, in the edit suite. How do you measure people's performances? I mean, Brad Pitt in uh, 12 Monkeys Monkey. comes to mind. I mean, do you know when you're getting it just right, if it's going over the top or if it's not enough? I, I don't know whether it's right at all. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure if, I've watched other directors sort of sit there and saying, mm, yes, one more, just a little bit. And you think they know what they're doing. I'm not convinced we do, because you get you have feelings about things. You know if somebody's really buggering it up, you know that. But whether it's absolutely right, I'm never sure. That's why I always do a few extra takes, just to give us a bit of variance, because in the editing room, you may want to shift the, the pace of it a bit. It's, it's really tricky. But you, you know pretty much if a guy's got it. It's, it's, uh, and I spend time in advance talking with people. In the case of Brad in 12 Monkeys, I put him together with a, 
um, sort of a, 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 a kind of a drama coach, dialogue coach. Um, he had worked with Jeff Bridges on uh, Fisher King, and I got him to train Brad to speak quickly because Brad really had never spoken that fast in his life, and and he worked so hard for months and months and months to get the speed up, um, and he came firing on the first day. He was there. He's just wham. Now, some people, I read reviews, they thought he was over the top. I didn't think so. I thought he was really spot on. There's a thing, I, what I do find, is that when you're dealing with characters that are semi-crazy, a lot of people in the real world don't believe, you know, people are like that out there. I mean, Brad, I thought, was a really good performance. I think it was really on, right on the button. The last film I've done is a thing called Tideland, and there's a young guy in there plays a retarded kid. And some people would say it's an over-the-top performance. And yet I've talked to uh, psychiatrists and people that work with retarded people and say, it's the most astonishing performance they've ever seen of somebody do. So, I don't I, I, my performance, my films are not realistic or naturalistic. I think they're heightened reality, or heightened naturalism. So there's room for actors to do bigger performances than they normally do. And I, I think maybe that's why they like working with me. I give them room to show off. <laughs> Without getting into the whole business of what happened with the distribution in America or Brazil, what effect did you think that had on your relationship with Hollywood? Oh, I think, I think I got, you know, a black mark against my name uh, with the battle over Brazil because Hollywood basically does things behind closed doors, you know, like any political capital. <laughs> the, things are done behind closed doors. The idea of publicly taking on a, a studio or a, a, the head of a studio more, more specifically and winning is something that really doesn't happen. I mean, the, the, the Battle of Brazil is a very rare success case and a very public one. And I think I got uh, a reputation of being nothing but trouble from that. And so there's plenty of people waiting for my next stumble, uh, which luckily came along with Munchausen uh, and they, they all felt better. Uh, he got his comeuppance, <laughs> is what it felt like. But, and it continues, I, I keep finding people are fearful of working with me because they think I'm out of control, you know, um, no respecter of budgets, trouble, blah. and basically it's not true. I mean, I've only had one problem, and that was the battle with Brazil was a public thing, and I've only done one film that went over budget, and that was Munchausen, and yet, that um, reputation hangs on. Anybody who's actually ever worked with me, any producer or any studio executive ever has actually worked with me knows that I'm a sweet little pussycat. So why have you got this reputation? Because they don't talk to each other. But they do, don't they? They don't, no, it's actually, no, it's really funny. It's surprising. They don't talk the way you think they do. There's, things float in Hollywood. Hollywood is a very strange place of rumors and sort of accepted wisdom. Nobody ever gets down and starts looking at the facts. I mean, I, I keep telling people, if you've any, got any doubts about what I'm like to work with, here's a list of people, call them. I, nobody's ever called these people. But don't they look at the numbers at least? The numbers, the numbers are good and bad. I've done films that have made a lot of money. Oh, and budgets. Our budgets are even more interesting because when we did um, 12 Monkeys, we, we made Baron Munchausen, it went over budget. Uh, I came back and did Fisher King in, in, uh, in Hollywood. We came in on budget, it was $24.5 million. Then it came to do uh, 12 Monkeys. Now, we needed to get a completion guarantor, uh, an insurance company, because we, that's the way we wanted to structure it, so it wasn't just a studio picture, it was, it was outside money. And when you do that, you need this insurance policy. And the in, uh, insurance people, uh, said, well, we're going to ask for a bigger contingency because of, uh, you know, you're, you're out of control. I said, wait a minute, look at all my films, and particularly look at my last one, a studio film. We came in on budget, maybe even under budget, and he said, That's not, we can't count on that because the studio budgets, you don't know what they are. The studios lie all the time because if you, as you're working forward on a film, if you can get the studio to agree to pay extra on that, extra on that, your budget can go up, but it's always still within the budget, even though it's not the budget you started out with. And that was a, a, an eye-opener for me to realize that the insurance companies can't tell what the real budget is on a studio film. So if they can't, who can? I mean, it seems to, I mean, you're always, one always hears about the mysteries of Hollywood accounting. 
no one seems to know ever what a film actually meant. No. It's, it's I mean, I've, because I, I've seen the statements, I get them and I see how little is left for me at the bottom of it. And it's, it's brilliant. That's where the real art of Hollywood is, is the counting, accounting, creative accounting. And they're brilliant. And it, it, it becomes a kind of uh, system that is good for everybody because you then have to get lawyers to go in and look at it. Then you have to get accountants, auditors to go in and audit. So that's more work and more money for more people. So the more complex you make it, the more people have to be um, brought into the system and they're all making money. So a few artists are there at the bottom of this inverted pyramid supporting lawyers and accountants and auditors and everything just to deal with the way that system works. And years ago, I said to one studio head, if you could actually come up with honest accounting, you would get everybody working there and you wouldn't be spending these huge amounts of money to make the film because, because people know they're going to be cheated. They want their money up front. And so the budgets go up on the films. And as the budgets go up, the executives get more nervous about the, you know, the, the, what's, what the film is about. And so they play safer and safer. So it's the people that suffer the most are the public who get stupider and dumber, dumber films all the time. How much is uh, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen as a film that we see today close to what you wanted to make? Strangely enough, there's, we've just done uh, some work because there's a new high-definition version of Munchausen coming out. And I was going through all of the, the original material. And there's, the main difference is the moon sequence, uh, where originally it was 2,000 people on the moon, their heads coming off. It was a huge Cecil B. DeMille spectacular starring Sean Connery and everybody. It's two people on the moon. That's the main difference in the film. There's, uh, there's a couple other smaller scenes that are out. Other than that, it's pretty much what we set out to do. I, th I think what intrigues me the most about that film is uh, the moon sequence, because it was a product of the film budget going out of control and having, to, having no money to, to finish that sequence. And so we got very inventive. And so you see things like the buildings when they first sail into the moon, all these buildings are moving back and forth. We were originally going to have these buildings built in three dimensions and they weren't going to be moving. And because we couldn't afford to do that, we just took the, the drawings of the buildings, mounted them on plywood, painted them up, and I had them go like that. It's much more interesting than what we would have done. Good. Yeah, we're what? We're back. We're back. So we're back with Terry Gilliam here in Rome, uh, <laughs> talking about what we're talking about. Films. Huh? You do what? Are oh, you talking about me? We're talking about me. The cameras are on me, not on you. He's dark, ugly, distorted, grotesque human being. Don't. I, of course, am beautiful. Don't listen to a word he says. <laughs> um, well. Well, what? you've forgotten everything. I have. You've blown my concentration. Okay. Mm. Do you see madness as a form of liberation? Do I find lab, lab, lab dancing as a form of liberation? Do you see lap dancing as a form of liberation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, well, madness, holy fools have been with uh, civilization since the beginning. Some cultures, you know, appreciate holy fools. Others are frightened of them. I think madness, children, People that are free from the normal constraints of reality often open interesting doors and windows to uh, the truth. So, yeah, I've always been intrigued by them, as long as they're not living next door. You don't want them next door. No, I don't want the property value of my house plummeting. <laughs> mad people belong in mad houses. <laughs> um, I mean, you got, when you had Bruce Willis for 12 Monkeys, mm. You had him in a post pop fiction moment when he was looking to do slightly more, less diehardian stuff. But did you have to keep the diehard out of Bruce Willis? No, the great thing about 12 Monkeys and, and Bruce's involvement is he wanted to show the world that he was a proper, serious, good actor. And, uh, and I said, fine. In, in that instance, you have to come without your entourage. You can't bring any of the, the nonsense that surrounds. Bruce Willis superstar, just what Bruce Willis actor. You come naked, effectively, and it's a, uh, and he did, and I think he did this extraordinarily good performance. Uh, there was only one, one week that got bad. He had to go and do some reshoots on Die Hard or one of those things, and he was gone for the weekend. 
and he came back, this different person. He came back, the guy from Die Hard. And I said, oh no, that's Bruce Willis Superstar, go away. And he calmed down again. But he, no, he, I think he was very frustrated because Pulp Fiction was a, an opportunity for him to show how good he was, but they didn't put him up for an Academy Award nomination. They went for Sam Jackson and uh, John Travolta instead. And Bruce was the reason the film got made. And he was not happy. And so 12 Monkeys, in some ways, was the beneficiary of his need to show the world again that he, he's got the chops. And Brad got the nomination. Brad got the nomination, yes. <laughs> the pain never ends. <laughs> it goes on and on and on. It was like Robin Williams did Awakenings. And he thought and it was a really good performance. He didn't get nominated. De Niro did, because De Niro had the twitches. Uh, we come to Fisher King, and I said, Robin, you'll get it this time, and he did. <laughs> Brad, Bruce, I mean, Bruce, Brad, Jeff does all the work of that movie, but Robin is the one that gets the stuff, and so he got nominated. It's funny how nominations have to do with ticks and twitches and, you know, props, as opposed to acting sometimes. So I heard you, I heard, I read, obviously, that you sent Mercedes Rule, Rule, how did she pronounce it? Rule. Mercedes Rule, a yeah. fax after she won. Fisher King, telling her it would be the kiss of death. Well, I did, I did something very cruel because Mercedes finally won the Oscar as Best Supporting Actress and everybody else was sending flowers and congratulations and I said, this is the kiss of death, you know, getting the Academy Award, your career is over. And I said it jokingly, but truth <laughs> comes out of jokes. I, but it's a terrible thing because what happens is you go from being an actor or an actress to a star and then the world changes. Suddenly, your agent's demanding more money. The parts are, you know, they can only be starring parts, and very quickly it all collapses again. It's, I think the, the Academy Award can be the kiss of death for a lot of people. So you're very happy never to touch you to one of This is, I will live forever, I think. Never going to be tainted with an Academy Award, I can almost guarantee. <laughs> How did Fisher King come to you? Because it wasn't, uh, was it already in development? No, my agent sent the Fisher King script to me in a package with another script that I was supposed to be taking seriously. And I just started reading it and I stayed up till about three or four in the morning. It was just, I thought, wow, I understand these characters. The writing is fantastic. And I got interested. I actually think the reason it was sent to me was they wanted Robin Williams in the film and, and all the other directors like Barry Levinson and others who had worked with Robin were busy. And so I think they came down the list. Ah, Gilliam, he worked with Robin. Let's send him the script and maybe we'll get Robin in the movie. And that's what happened. Even though the movie you'd worked with Robin Williams was Munchausen. Yeah, but that's why they knew I had worked with him. And that's how I would get in. See, Fisher King was after Munchausen. Yeah. And, and they thought, he knows Robin, so he can be the bait. Bearing in mind that at that time, you were inverted on as damaged goods post Munchausen. It didn't matter. There were, see, what was interesting, uh, post Munchausen, there's always somebody in Hollywood, somebody intelligent, somebody who still thinks they can control the beast. And so since I'd been turned into a beast, there was always somebody wanting to be the lion tamer. And luckily, uh, they produced the film. And then they discovered I wasn't a beast, so they were very disappointed. Are you a beast? No, I'm just passionate. <laughs> You must, uh, see, my job is to protect the film at all costs, uh, even if it means firing myself. I keep saying to people, you know, if the director's out of line, get rid of him, because the important thing is the film. Well, protecting the film at all costs reminded, reminds me of something. You're going to ask the cost? The cost? What's the cost? Mm. That you, once you'd said, uh, I have risen above such petty details as costs. No, but defending the film against all costs, the costs are usually against myself. They're usually personal damage. So I'm, I, I lied. I'm, I'm, I, I do care about financial costs, but personal damage, the cost to my soul, I'm willing to bear. Do you actually like your image as this sort of rebellious, to hell with the budget, to hell with the cast? I mean, image. No, because I th it's actually got to the point that I'm really tired of it. It's just it's, because it's so ridiculously untrue. And it actually is probably has probably held me back doing a lot of films that might have come my way, but the fear is out there. Now, literally, Munchausen is the only film that came in over budget. Everything else has come in on budgets that people can't even believe that we could work that cheaply. 
That's what got me in trouble on Munchausen, because we made Brazil. We had a budget of $15 million on Brazil. We came in a million and a half under budget. And they thought, well, this guy can do anything. Which of your films, Dutch, did you find you hear, you get asked about the most by people? Well, Brazil lingers the most because I think it's the most, you know, it touches on things so current. That gets talked about all the time. Munchausen is the interestingly surprising one. You know, walking down the streets and people bump into me and say, oh, I love Munchausen. And that's, it really, it's sort of grown over the years uh, to be the film that I think an awful lot of people really love. Fisher King, they love because it's the most romantic. It just depends who you bump into. And I like the fact that everybody's got a different opinion of, of my films, and that's good. No, I mean, Munchausen is, um, is one of my great regrets is not seeing it at the cinema. I only ever saw it on VHS, and then it's the got such a lousy distribution. Oh, I mean, Munchausen was just dumped out there. It was, it was terrible what they did to it. Up on a big screen, it was spectacular. What, the best thing about watching it on a big screen is with a lot of children and watching kids coming out of there just wide-eyed and dancing. No, there was a woman that once said to me that she'd seen it, and it was, they don't make films like that anymore. I know. I mean, it was because it is incredible. It's beautiful. What's interesting about when I watch Brazil, because I've had to watch the, 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 the HD master uh, a couple of weeks ago in LA, I just look at it and say, how did I do that? It's so big, it's so extraordinary. It's Munchausen or Brazil? Yeah. Munchausen? Yeah, you said Brazil. Did I say Brazil? Yeah, say. Freud, we can just edit it out. Munchausen, just my lips, Munchausen. Bramulsen, Bramunchausen, Brazil Mausen. So you're watching the HD master of what? I was watching the HD Master of Brazil. Uh, oops, I've said it again. Uh, <laughs> I was, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching the HD Master of Munchausen, which is about to come out uh, in HD format. And I was astonished at the scale of the thing and kept wondering how I personally had actually been able to make that film. You think that'll cut in nicely now? I'm sure I think, yeah. yeah. I'm going to spit the audio and maybe even a special effect around your head or something. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do what I never do. I'm going to read this one. Uh -oh. Actors like Jonathan Price, Peter Stormare, Jeff Bridges, and I'll even mention Ian Holm and Ralph Richardson have this ability to play comedy and dangerous at the same time. Is that something that you look for? Comedy and danger, I love it. In fact, I think the person who probably did it best in all the films was Oliver Reed in Munchausen as Vulcan. Terry Jones, when he saw the film, thought I'd found my perfect actor uh, because Ollie is so, it's one of the great performances of his because he is so funny and he's so pathetic and he's so frighteningly dangerous all at the same time. Now, it, it, it has to do, I think, with a lot to do with English actors and the way they're trained. They're trained in all skills. American actors seldom are trained in the range that uh, English actors are. But I, I, I do like, it. I've got to keep comedy in my movies. I, if there's not laughs in it, it's not a decent representation of life. It's curious. I mean, you had Jonathan Price playing Sam Lowry as Sam Lowry is in Brazil. Mm. But then you subsequently used him in these rather meaner situations. Yeah, it was a chance. I mean, once it, when he'd done Sam, that was a great performance. And then we, see, Jonathan lives just uh, a short distance away from me in London, so it's hard not to have him in my films. He keeps knocking on the door, demanding with threats. <laughs> And so I, I like the idea of him being the opposite character in Munchausen, where he's just the opposite. He's the voice of reason, and he's uh, the bad guy. And, and then it came to doing uh, uh, The Brothers Grimm. And, and it was interesting, because originally Jonathan was supposed to, I wanted Jonathan to play the Peter Stormare part. And the, the, the powers that be, the lovely Weinstein brothers, all singing, all dancing. Um, said, no, Jonathan can't do comedy. They, they're wise, they know these things, they understand comedy. So I gave him the part of uh, Della Tom, which he made just as funny. <laughs> Fear and loathing in Las Vegas, because the clock is running. Um, mm. Who is Hunter S. Thompson, for those who've never heard or seen Hunter S. Thompson? Oh, I've got a lot of work to do then. Ooh. Hunter S. Thompson was really the voice of the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s for me. He was the gon he invented gonzo journalism, which is basically a form of journalism where you're not um, objective and Olympian. 
you are in there. You are part of the story. The, the writer is the story. And he basically, I think, spoke for my generation uh, about the, the frustrations of America during the war and, and, and the sort of dream that we can make the world a better place and the failure to do so. Um, and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was just one of those seminal books. It really described my generation, I felt, uh, um, and the madness of our failure. Um, so that's who Hunter Thompson is, or was. He is no longer. He has been shot into the air. I had this wonderful funeral where Johnny Depp, Ralph Steadman, who drew the uh, drawings for the book uh, Fear and Loathing, designed this great rocket fist. Hunter's ashes were put into it. Johnny paid for this multi-million dollar event and they blasted Hunter into the sky. And next morning, all the residents of Aspen, Colorado, where this event took place, went out to get in their cars and discover they had to wipe the windscreens clean. Hunter was everywhere. <laughs> yeah, his final say on this issue. It's just wonderful. <laughs> so what was your take on the film? Why did you make it being the completely, the word in the time is delirious, I suppose, but it's, uh, I mean, it's out there, isn't it? Well, the book is out there. It's, it's, it's you know, it's uh, a totally unapologetic bit of uh, living, writing, and then filmmaking. Um, I actually wasn't originally in, involved in the project in the beginning. In fact, for years, people have been trying to get me to do it, but I always had something else to do. And it was only when Alex Cox had started the project and got Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro on board and then was subsequently fired um, that they approached me and I wanted to work with Johnny. And I said, okay, let's, we'll start again. We'll, re, we'll write a new script and we'll go. It was a nice situation where everything was rolling by the time I was you know, brought on to it. And we just kept it rolling as fast as we could. And um, I remember at the end of the film, the studios, uh, Universal Studios as a matter of fact, um, head of production at the time there, or one of the heads, was feeling we should contextualize the film, put a little bookend to explain the times and the people and why they behaved like this. And I said, no, it has to be done in the spirit of the book and you just go. And it's about two men with you know, good people pushed to the limit and they don't know how to deal with anything except by pushing themselves to the limit. And uh, what's interesting about that film is again, it was treated rather badly, distributed, unfortunately, terribly in the States. And it's probably proved to be the biggest DVD success I've had. It's a film that plays continuously. It's, it's like an underground river uh, uh, corrupting the youth of many nations. Well, I'm sure at 1 or 2 a.m. that film <laughs> is being seen the way it should have been seen. Um, Brothers Grimm, just to touch on it very quickly, it was the first time you used a CG? No, no, I've, I've been using CG for a long time. I, I have my own effects house that, uh, that does this, but I disguise it so you don't notice it. The best CG work, the best effects work are when you don't notice them. 12 Monkeys has got, you know, it's got giraffes running around the place, but they're not there. They've got lions and things, it's just, but they're well done. Uh, what happened on Brothers Grimm, I was trying to originally do it in a much more old fashioned way with maquettes and, 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 and uh, physical things. But the effects company that was on board didn't come up to scratch. And so we ended up having to do uh, far more CG work than originally intended. And I got to be much more of a fan of CG work. I, I learned how to disguise it even more. The problem with CG is because you can do anything now, the trick is not to do everything. I'm trying to hold back and use it carefully. And I think I did. I think. Hey, oh, here's, oh, I've got to tell you, this is good. Just, I, I keep flashing into that lens with my, my watch. I just notice it's really good. And some good effects, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we got, uh, I, when the film came out, there was, I read quite a few reviews saying that they thought the effects were rather cheesy, not particularly good. And I kept hearing this, and I was getting more and more, because with every effects film, there's always going to be X number of shots that don't really work properly. You can do it in any film. And I know where the ones that don't work are. But 
generally there's 500, no, no, I think there's more than that, there's 700 shots in there. And I was getting very tired and I was at a film festival last year and a journalist uh, said, you know, the effects in Grimm's, I mean, what happened, what went wrong? I said, okay, I've had enough of this. What are you talking about? I want you to name one specific shot so I understand what you're talking about. He said, well, there's that scene where Matt's got that big frog or toad and he's licking it. I mean, it's a terrible CG frog. I said, no, that's a real one. <laughs> the poor guy died. I mean, he just shriveled up and died at that point. So that's very weird. It's a, people seem to be experts, but I don't know what they're talking about half the time. Um, but anyway. How do you feel about the whole Lost in La Mancha business? Um, well, I'm glad somebody recorded it because my memory is terrible. And it's, it's a good thing to go back and remind myself why I should never make a movie again. Uh, it's, it's a good film. Um, it got me sympathy in Hollywood. Suddenly, the terrible out of control Gilliam became a sweet victim. And, and Hollywood loves a victim. So I think it probably helped my career enormously. Um, we're, we're almost, I've been saying this for several years now, but we're on the verge of getting the script back, finally, after all these years. And I mean, it's like that close. It's so close getting this thing back. Are we going to use Phil Kill? Ah, uh, that's, I don't know yet. We, we can't, we have to start again on that one. Okay. Um, over the last few years, we've seen you know, Junior Wizards, Hobbits, Gladiators, Pirates. Do you think someone's, the series have hijacked your, uh, your, your personal genres? I was just reading about that the other day on, on uh, a website. They were actually saying that very thing, that there's a lot of competition out there and there may be better. I, I mean, I look at Peter Jackson, his work is extraordinarily good. I mean, he's really great. They're all out there. I, yeah, they, yeah, they're in that territory, and I suppose I'm going different directions now because of it. I've always been very perverse. If everybody's going that way, I go that way, just to carve out another section. And it's, it, was, it was actually interesting with Brothers Grimm because with the Harry Potters and the, the you know, Lord of the Rings and the Van Helsings, where everything is so big, I was trying to bring it all back down to something much smaller. And I think I was criticized for that because we weren't doing the spectacle, but I was trying to, let's go back down to the kind of you know, illustrations I used to see in, in, in books when I was a kid. Something smaller, everything's more close at hand. Uh, and I've gotten even smaller on the last one with Tideland. I've just gone really small on that and uh, left it to a little girl with Barbie doll heads. Who needs hobbits when you got Barbie doll heads on your fingers? Has there been any of those big productions that you would have liked to have got your hands on? Um, I, see, I was never a big fan of Tolkien, so, but I thought Jackson did a brilliant job on the first one in particular. I thought they really captured the magic. Um, Harry Potter, they dragged me out to L.A. because J.K. Rowling wanted me to direct it, but the studio was not going to hire me. So, But I got a free trip out to L.A. so I could do some other things. Um, not really. I don't spend much time thinking, oh, if only. It's, it's kind of a waste. I, 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 my if only has to do with my own scripts that haven't been made. That's where I'm frustrated, where I've got a couple, what I think are very good ones, that they're expensive and they just don't seem to, to fall into the categories that are currently fashionable. So. Penultimate question. Penultimate? Penultimate. Really? Penultimate. Two to go? Can I use that word? Well, it's one and a half. <laughs> 1.34, let's say. Um, all right, you've been doing this for about 40 years now, if not more. What have you learned in all that time? I don't know what I've learned, to be honest. I mean, I, I, I wish I hadn't learned some of the things I have learned because I think I know too much sometimes and it's, it gets in the way of my belief in my ability to get things off the ground. I think that's, that's the thing I've learned and that's the unfortunate thing. I know how difficult it is and how like, unlikely a thing won't happen. So I have to trick myself. I mean, I've written a new script and I had to write it in a month because I felt, felt if it took any longer, I would lose the belief in being able to write a script. So I've learned nothing but bad things. Such as? The fact that I can't get the money to make the films I want to make. <laughs> you do, you, you get money. No, I don't. If you actually look at the time and how many films I've done and, and the things I've written that are sitting out there, most of my time is not making movies. It's about not getting movies made, trying to get movies made. 
Yeah, that's the Orson Welles, isn't it? The, uh, he spent his entire life trying to raise money for things yeah. he never met. Yeah. But you do have a lot, you have a quite a considerable body of work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not bad, but you know, compared to, to who else? Uh, Steven Spielberg? <laughs> Otherwise, you're quite happy with what you've done so far. I'm, the, the, the thing that I do like is I like all my films. There's nothing I'm embarrassed about, nothing I feel shame. Because uh, I talk to so many directors who, oh, I didn't like that one or that. I mean, whatever I've done, it's been what I wanted to do to the extent that I could within the circumstances. But I can, I can basically say my signature is on each of them. I haven't, I can't do... Uh, you know, uh, the director's cut. They were all done the first time, the director's cut, unfortunately. Sono stanco. <laughs> May you continue to build the rides and we will continue to buy the tickets. You know what I mean? I've said this to you before, I'll say it to you again.